Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of India International Center, I extend a very warm welcome to each one of you. At the onset, we would like to extend a very special welcome to our eminent guest speaker, Dr. Anil Kakodkar, Chancellor, Homi Baba National Institute, Chairman, Rajiv Gandhi Science and Technology Commission, and former Chairman, Atomic Energy Commission, who has taken time out from his extremely busy schedule to be with us this evening. Dr. Kakodkar, we are extremely honored to have you with us. Thank you. I also extend a very warm welcome to Dr. R. Chidambaram, DAE, Homi Baba Professor, Baba Atomic Research Center, and former Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, who has kindly accepted our invitation to chair this program. Last, but not by any means least, I would like to welcome Dr. Shalesh Naik, Life Trustee of the IIC, who as convener of the center's Diamond Jubilee Cluster Group on Science is responsible for conceptualizing and putting together this evening's talk. Our grateful thanks to you, Dr. Nair. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's talk marks a very special occasion for us here at India International Center. This year, the center is celebrating its Diamond Jubilee. As many of you would be aware, the center was inaugurated on 22nd January 1962 by the then Vice President of India, Dr. Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan. To commemorate this special occasion, the center will be organizing a year-long celebration by way of conducting a variety of programs, talks, discussions, seminars, special performances and exhibition and so on. We are advised in our endeavors by Diamond Jubilee Organizing Committee. The committee has constituted six subject cluster groups to identify and conceptualize the programs to be conducted. Dr. Kalkodkar's talk this evening is the first program to be organized by the cluster group on science. Once again, I welcome each one of you and I now hand over this evening's proceedings to our chair, Dr. R. Chidamram. Dr. Chidambaram, sir. Thank you, Kanwal Waliji. Shri N.N. Ora, Dr. Anil Kakotka, Dr. Shailesh Nayak, Shri Kanwal Wali, other distinguished participants, either directly or through the, the web, and also hopefully some young, some young friends. I'm very happy that um, during this uh, Diamond Jubilee celebration of India International Center, you have organized this lecture by my distinguished colleague, Dr. Anil Kakotka, with whom I have worked for a, for a very, very long time in the Bhava Atomic Research Center. He joined, the, Dr. Kakotka joined the BRC in 1964 and became its director in the year 1996. He was also the Chairman Atomic Energy Commission during the period 2000 to 2009. He was DAE Homi Baba Professor, Chair Professor during 2010 to 2015. Then also INAE, Indian National Academy of Engineering, Satish Dhawan, Chair of Engineering Eminence during January 2015 to 2017, and currently he is a distinguished chair professor of the All India Institute of Technical, Technical Education. Dr. Kakotkar, a brilliant nuclear engineer, has worked for the development of the atomic energy program in India throughout his professional life. The focus of his work has been on self-reliant development of nuclear reactor systems to address the Indian energy requirements. He has developed various systems for the pressurized heavy water reactor, in the building of the Dhruva reactor, starting from the conceptual stage, rehabilitation of Madras Atomic Power Station Units 1 and 2, and in conceptualization and development of the advanced heavy water reactor. 
because it's one of the aims is the use of thorium and related uh, technical techno technology systems so that we make use of our vast thorium resources for energy production. This is the third stage of our nuclear program. He also created a roadmap for shipping this third stage of uh, utilizing, uh, utilizing thorium. And uh, as not only as a source for energy production, but also a primary source for other forms of energy use. He continues to be actively involved in the programs related to the augmentation of thorium utilization in our nuclear power programs and for the development of non-fossil primary sources for meeting our energy needs. And as you all know, with the threat of uh, climate change, global warming, we have to go for non-fossil energy resources. So he has also been a key contributor to our India strategic program, was closely involved in both the peaceful nuclear explosion experiment of 1974 and the series of successful nuclear weapon tests in May 1998 at, uh, at Pokhara. Of course, he has also been very closely involved in the nuclear submarine, the development of the nuclear power pack technology, submarine power pack technology, developed under his uh, under the leadership. Notable also are his innovative contributions to human resource development, establishment of NISA, National Institute of Science, Education and Research. DAE Mumbai University Center for Basic Science, Omi Baba National Institute, HBNI, and, and generating, the whole idea is to generate a top class human resource for the country, and also generating greater experimental capabilities, and also bringing in a linkage between basic research and technology development. Of course, he was also involved in our, our new centers at Vishakapatnam, Hyderabad, Kolkata, and Bangalore. So it's fully, and uh, he has been uh, chairman of the Solar Energy Corporation, as I mentioned, and he's fully qualified to speak on the clean energy transitions in India, because he has a view from both sides, nuclear as well as the solar energy side, and in the context of the climate change threat, both these are very, very important, uh, important uh, sources of electricity for us, as has also been recognized by the International Panel on Climate Change. So may I now request Dr. Anil Kakotka to give his talk on clean energy transitions in India. Dr. Kakotka. Thank you, Dr. Chidambaram. Uh, Dr. Chidambaram, uh, Sri N. N. Vora, Professor Silesh Nayak, Sri Vali, all distinguished participants who are uh, in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to First, thank uh, India International Center for this opportunity to speak today, a very important day, the National Science Day, uh, and also speak on a very important topic, uh, and that is uh, to look at uh, the clean energy transition, which has become crucially important for survival uh, of the entire humanity, in fact. So that includes obviously all of us. So compliments to India International Center on the uh, on the Diamond Jubilee, and uh, uh, and as I said, thanks to the organizers for this opportunity. What I'm going to do is to essentially present a, 
a very broad a macro picture of the clean energy transition for india uh, and of course i will be talking for from my own my own perspective and let me let me share my screen and uh, get on with the talk i hope my screen is visible yes it's visible sir okay so uh, what i'm going to speak the outline is as follows i'll first talk about the present energy supply and demand scene and uh, and the extrapolation potential extrapolation uh, because you know we are talking about uh, a fairly large time period we are we from today till 2070 which is the date when india has committed to our reach net zero and so we are talking about a 50 year horizon uh, and it's very difficult to uh, carry out projections for such a long period so obviously there will be a lot of judgment lot of a uh, lot of extrapolations but uh, we'll begin from the present scene energy supply demand and uh, uh, we will identify where we want to go and guess what is the route that we may have to negotiate there are going to be serious challenges and i'll talk about them challenges in terms of uh, the availability of uh, green energy itself uh, and and i'm using that because uh, see in the country most of the people consider renewable as green and uh, if you restrict to that definition then there are serious challenges and i'll talk about that i'll also talk about importance of biomass particularly the the so called non commercial energy and then uh, talk briefly about the potential mega trends which uh, we might witness in this transition of 50 years uh, i'll also talk about challenges in renewable energy integration which uh, is a big challenge in itself and we should talk more about that and then of course uh, we'll talk uh, a bit about further directions that uh, we should uh, seek or expect or push for for nuclear energy so let me begin uh, with the demand supply situation and uh, the sankey diagram in the center of this figure is actually uh, reproduced from the energy statistics india 2021 uh, and of course there is a lot of data so uh, without getting cluttered up uh, with so many details to simplify matters the supply side is kind of tabulated on the on the left hand table and the demand side uh, in a manner of speaking is tabulated on the on the right hand side and, and i'll explain uh, this in a bit now clearly as we all know supply side today is mostly fossil energy 62% coal around 28% crude oil and around 6% gas the green energy or clean energy meaning renewable including nuclear together so that constitutes just around 3 and 1/2 to 4% of this total energy on the on the supply side and so when you are talking about to green energy transition we are talking about jumping from 3.7% to 100% that is for the energy that we consume as on today and we should recognize that india is still on development path and so india's energy needs would go up at least 
five or six times or maybe even more as time passes and so we have to also continue with the clean energy supply uh, even to support that increase in energy demand and also the way it is delivered to the users uh, that composition is likely to change now presently of all the energy the first uh, or the second column in the table on the right hand side uh, you would notice that uh, the uh, you know those numbers there are percentage of total primary energy uh, uh, so this is essentially uh, primary energy consumed as listed on the left hand side table and all that is 100% and the numbers in this second column are the percentage of that total so out of that uh, for example uh, uh, industry consumes around uh, 32% energy 4.7% uh, as electricity and 27% as uh, thermal energy or sometimes you have to give also to support the process needs so there is a dual role there something like uh, 18% is consumed by the residential and agriculture sector uh, again 6.1% as electricity and 11.5% as heat and something like uh, around 6% and mind you as I, I, I want to repeat these numbers are uh, the percentage of the total primary energy consumed uh, so many times if you if you look at it only among the the user whatever energy is used of that percentage that percentage is uh, is obviously uh, it will be higher and it will change so to come back, the transport would consume around 6% of the total energy at the primary consumption level. And uh, uh, all of it is essentially goes as thermal heat in internal combustion engines and, and so on. Now, going forward on the supply side, as I said, we will have to make a very rapid scale up to clean energy sources. And during that period, 50 odd years, I think we'll have to emphasize gas economy in a big way because that's an excellent bridging fuel. That's also the global trend. You know, there is better outlook for gas than oil. And, uh, but there are of course security issues and, and supply infrastructure issues. But if you notice the world, the globally gas economy is roughly around 20%. We are only around 6%. And I think in terms of making clean fuel available till such time we re reach the real green fuel, I think gas will play an important role. And that's an important transition that uh, I do expect on the supply side. Now on the user side, uh, I think the energy forms that will be of importance, uh, they uh, are electricity, hydrogen, and bioenergy. And I think we'll need to talk about how much of electricity, how much of hydrogen, and of course, bioelectric, uh, bioenergy is something we should make use of the entire quantum that is available. And uh, uh, I'll talk about that. In, in one of the slides. So broadly, the transition that we expect is the residential and agricultural domain, uh, which currently is, occupies 31% uh, share of the total current energy use. Uh, that uh, would transition, tran it will transition into electricity and biomass. And uh, Biomass, because you know, our kitchens, uh, if we have to use clean fuel, we have to use uh, electricity. I can't think of transiting to hydro hydrogen 
so soon there there are going to be issues there and uh, so electricity may not be able to take care of all our needs and so the gas is important and if you want uh, the gas in the form of clean fuel then bioenergy or biomethane is a great source and uh, it the same thing is true about uh, bioethanol and other uh, other bioenergy forms you can get from our biomass now the important thing is this is a decentralized energy source leveraging it, it constitutes as much as 25 to 30% of our total energy basket it doesn't uh, appear so in many uh, tabulations simply because most of it is non commercial energy and there is not enough data and uh, and and also accounting doesn't take care of that but if uh, and i'll i'll show a separate table on how much of that energy is so it's a significant energy only thing is today we make use of that in a very inefficient way uh, which damages the air quality it creates health problem so we need to use that with technology which make sure that we deliver clean fuel and we make efficient use of that energy and of course electricity is bound to be uh, an important uh, input on the industrial side which is roughly around 58% of the total current energy use i think that would probably transition to electricity hydrogen and i have a feeling that even in 2070 we may need to use uh, significant uh, quantities of hydrocarbon and in fact even coal and uh, to adhere to our net zero commitment that would mean uh, appropriate or proportionate deployment of carbon capture and utilization or carbon capture utilization and sequestration technologies and that is a major major challenge and it's also is going to add cost to the energy use in a very significant way on the transport which is around 10% if you look at it on the user side of the total current energy use i think that will transition into electricity uh, and hydrogen task electricity for uh, short distance transport for small vehicles uh, city transportation for example uh, and hydrogen for heavy transportation with long endurance cross country transportation and uh, and i am very clear that that is where the economy would lie and uh, and i think uh, there is good amount of work that is already going on on both these both these fronts so uh, the green energy transition that we are talking about uh, in that context in the supply context the as well as in the usage context i think it requires a major major rethink now uh, and i'll explain explain that why now india has committed to reach net zero emission by 2070 and we have done that at glasgow by the time india that is by that 2070 uh, you know our economy will grow our energy use will go and there is a relationship between energy consumption and human development index and this figure is total energy consumption not just electricity because many times in the transition discussion if you focus only on electricity uh in fact you lose track of many things so i i have chosen to talk about energy consumption in kilogram oil equivalent per capita per year and uh, so as uh, the economy grows you need more energy and of course uh, energy and human development index also there is a correlation and uh, today uh, our human development index is some distance away from the best human development index some of the advanced countries are enjoying and i think it should be india's aspiration that uh, 
we will also reach a quality of life or human development index in india comparable with the best in the world and of course sooner we reach there better it is and uh, so uh, total energy that one would require can be estimated on this ground using this correlation and i'm sure by 2070 india can be expected to surpass annual per capita energy consumption level necessary to be on the par on par with the best in the world in the context of human development index the threshold per capita energy consumption taking into account improvements in efficiency as a result of clean energy transition could in fact be better lower at around 1400 kg oil equivalent per capita per year as against 2400 kg oil equivalent uh, as shown in this figure and that is because you know for example when you make major transition to electricity use uh, say transportation uh, if you see you know the, the efficiency improves and more particularly hydrogen energy and that to getting hydrogen directly from clean energy high temperature nuclear reactors or the solar thermal and without going through electricity you convert it to hydrogen uh, you also get much more efficiency so the thumb up rule many countries for example french people are estimating their policies on the basis of 60 it is 40% saving as a result of these additional efficiencies and so uh, if you go by that yardstick uh, 1400 kg oil uh, equivalent per capita uh, would be the right threshold and multiply that with our uh, steady state uh, population i have taken 1.6 billion people you end up in uh, uh, 28000 terawatt hour per year uh, as the total energy that uh, we need to find and we need to supply uh, compare that with the present uh, level at the consumption end of 6600 terawatt hour per year so that is the jump that we need to negotiate now uh, total renewable energy potential and uh, you know professor sukhatme had done uh, in fact he had done an iterative study and uh, earlier he had estimated even a lower number but uh, after that detailed study has come to a higher number and that study shows that the total renewable energy potential in india is at around 6000 terawatt hour per year now in that study the contribution of biomass is just around 60 terawatt hour per year and that's because as i told you that uh, uh, you know the non commercial energy and commercial energy but if you factor that commercial energy you can get Uh, the bioenergy potential to the tune of around 2500 terawatt hour so the short point that we need to recognize is total renewable energy including biomass uh, we can uh, hope to reach something like 8300 8400 terawatt hour per year as against uh, the need that we should aim at of around 28000 terawatt hour and that is the gap and i don't see that gap under any discussion or any dis- energy discourse in the country and i think uh, we need to think about how we can close that gap and obviously the only answer for bridging that gap is nuclear energy and uh, and now uh, of course uh, we are pursuing an ambitious program in nuclear energy including the three stage program which is a technology development program so uh, there is a rate uh, at which we can add capacity but now that we have access to uranium 
and also we have much more uranium in the country uh, i think we can accelerate uh, nuclear program uh, leveraging uh, availability of uh, uranium in the required quantities and uh, but the challenges to producing requisite electricity or setting up requisite capacity within this time frame and again i see a huge gap there and i think there must a national program needs to gear up it's not just dae and the country wide uh, we must have to you know plan uh, create policies implementation strategies and put this in place because this gap uh, you would notice is far too large uh, uh, to be bridged in the so called business as usual manner now uh, to talk about bioenergy uh, this is a simple uh, uh, search from various sources and i have given a break up of uh, the firewood the sustainable production of firewood animal dung surplus agricultural residue municipal solid waste and all this put together it accounts to amounts to something like 2000 to 2500 terawatt hour and i think we should be conscious about making uh, leveraging is fully and as i said looking at uh, the objective of uh, you know a convenient energy for our kitchens uh, a convenient energy for our agriculture uh, and also most importantly um uh, support or energizing rural economy uh, i think we should give a major thrust to thrust to bioenergy in the right way and uh, uh, and again this is a technology challenge uh, and we seem to be somewhat drifting uh, on that but uh, i think it's very important for india's energy future to look at potential mega trends in this uh, in this context uh, it looks to me that uh, the uh, the total energy consumption in india uh, would increase four to five times and this would happen at the rate consistent with economic growth and uh, once we reach there let's say and once we achieve the best possible human development index does not mean that the energy consumption will stop it has not happened in any country what might happen is on one side there might be uh, uh, you know transition in the sense the the economy may become more energy efficient but the economy will keep growing every country will want to uh, be uh, in the competitive market and and so there will be continuous search for new energy sources uh but uh, leave that aside but the point is it will be the economy which will dictate uh, increase in the energy consumption clean energy consumption as i said earlier would however need to increase almost 80 times not just four to five times because uh, we have uh, you know to cover everything that we are doing using all fossil energy and allow for increase in energy consumption and this uh, has to be at a rate consistent with our ambition and efforts to reach net zero target and this i think is a big big challenge the increase has to come primarily through renewables including bioenergy as i said and of course nuclear now except biomass all other clean energy sources they first produce electricity and that's an important point we should recognize the solar energy as we know because we haven't done much in solar thermal and wind energy essentially produces energy in the form of electricity and then you want to use energy in other form you have to go through a conversion 
bioenergy is of course you can first produce uh, um, uh, a fuel material and and use it for whichever way including production of electricity and that's where there is important the solar thermal and high temperature nuclear reactors both are yet to be developed but they can produce hydrogen directly by thermochemical splitting and in uh, nuclear uh, reactor case maybe a, a little bit coming from radiation dissociation of water and uh, it when that happens then the demand for in electricity for production of hydrogen could considerably reduce uh, and uh, because in absence of that the electricity would form roughly around 80% of the total energy demand and uh, and then of course uh, another technologies to convert electricity into hydrogen through electrolysis and so on so uh, that is a that is a major major challenge and i think we need to be aware of this we need to be planning that and have a strategy going forward so as i said the share of electricity would thus need to go up from current 18% to around uh, 35% if we restrict uh, electricity use to the small car transportation sector or city transportation sector then uh, i think it would suffice if we reach up to 35% and the rest of the uh, demand in the form of hydrogen or green hydrogen can come from hydrogen produced uh, directly from solar or electric uh, nuclear energy but if that is not the case then of course uh, uh, we'll need to produce uh, all, you know the electricity share of the total energy would go up uh, uh, almost 80% and um, and then of course we have to also uh, become more efficient in electrolysis through use of steam electrolysis and uh, reach net zero emission so it all depends on how we organize and many of these technologies are under development throughout the world so we need the, a lot of catching up to do and because our requirements of energy are going to be more urgent compared to anybody else and so if we depend on development of these technologies from outside and and bring them to india then i think we are unlikely to make use of the advanced technologies and we'll be uh, sort of uh, forced to use uh, the technologies which are available which may not be necessarily most efficient so we need an optimum combination of uh, electricity generating system uh, to uh, to assure diversity of supply optimum peak capacity investments and stability of grids and even this peak capacity investments in stability of grids is another important factor uh, that uh, that we must uh, we must talk about so uh, now this is what uh, is the picture uh, the uh, you know the figure on the right hand side uh, uh, it's a it's a three axis diagram vertic vertical axis being tariff and uh, two horizontal axis one uh, is the carbon emission constraint and the other one is the decarbonization scenario uh, that is the mix between uh, nuclear and variable renewable energy this figure uh, is from an oecd report and the calculations were actually done uh, by mit and there was an mit report which was published little earlier and this figure is also available in mit report so i think it's a well studied document accepted uh, at the level of oecd nea uh, so we can trust this now this study show that as one approaches net zero uh that is the origin of this figure 
then uh, a mix uh, relying uh, the you know if so, mix relying primarily on nuclear energy is the most cost effective option to achieve decarbonization target that is you know if you if you approach uh, uh, zero nuclear 100% uh, variable renewable energy and on the other side you approach uh, zero carbon emission constraint that is everything uh, carbon free uh, then uh, you would notice in this figure that the cost of electricity uh, is almost uh, two to three times what it was or what it would be when we are lying on the planar part of this figure and uh, if you remain at uh, near the origin uh, and move along the the decarbonization scenario axis and come away from vre and come to higher level of nuclear you also approach that plateau and where the cost of renewable uh, cost of in, uh, electrical energy would be much lower compared to 100% vre case and this is an important point that needs to be appreciated and i have been activating several groups both within dae and outside to look at that the tragedy was uh, we didn't have the capability of uh, making this calculation till recently now of course uh, there are uh, i think some people who are approaching this they not reached there but they are approaching this but the important to note is that uh, this study shows that uh, the uh, uh, for example uh, this study has looked at regions in united states and china and some other places so the minimum average generation cost at low emission without nuclear would become twice in new england region in usa and could become four times in tbt region in china and the share of nuclear capacity as a percentage of peak demand uh, to to reach that uh, optimum tariff uh, has been projected to be around 60% in new england region of usa and around 80% in tbt region in china so uh, i am sure it would be eye opener to many of you but this arises because of this issue of renewable energy integration and it's not just a question of stabilizing the grid or or battery capacity in the grid and so on it has also to do with the fact that uh, grid has to cater to variable demand and at the same time uh, if there is 100% uh, variable renewable energy then the generation source also becomes variable and so you need to have adequate capacity to cater to demand because the peaks in the two cases may not necessarily coincide and uh, and this is a challenge and you you don't see this as you can see in this figure you don't see when the share of renewable energy is smaller it only appears when the share becomes larger and we are already seeing this in our own indian context uh, when the uh, when the current level of variable renewable energy integration is just around 24 25% in installed capacity terms and in around 10 11% in generation terms and the and the recent uh, uh, studies or recent reports of uh, central electricity authority and more particularly the forum of regulators of central electricity authority shows that even at that level we are actually paying more money by way of these issues for example uh, the surplus standard capacity and the resultant cost has been estimated in the range of rupees uh, 1 rupee 34 paise similarly the balancing cost of renewables has been estimated to be in the range of rupees 1 rupee 10 paise by ca and the estimate of standard capacity in that uh, document has been estimated at around uh, 1 rupee 2 paise per unit 
so uh, it's not as if uh, what this study shows is not being observed we are only observing these trends and i think we better become alive you know people talk about cost of batteries has come down they are talking about uh, renewable energy for battery but those are battery supply for a few hours and that's a quite different matter and that should not be allowed to obfuscate obfusc this issue about uh, about to renewable energy integration now so in that context what should be the elements of our clean energy policy according to me electricity hydrogen and bioenergy the key feed, feeder they will be the key feeders for meeting energy demand now uh, we must reserve the compressed biogas for cooking energy bio cng for running agricultural machinery of course a lot of it will also run on electricity but in addition to that and uh, and so that will account for out of uh, a total of 18000 terawatt hours that will account for around 2500 terawatt hour per year energy supply we must emphasize decentralized renewables for rural and remote areas through micro grids interconnected to the main grid and that's an important issue you know if you just leave it as micro grid uh, it's not very popular people don't like it uh, so we must assure them the quality of supply leveraging both main grid as well as micro grid and uh, we are doing that in the context of uh, for example uh, the rooftop uh, supplies it can also be done in the context of micro grids we must develop and deploy solar thermal and high temperature nuclear reactors for hydrogen production uh, through thermochemical splitting of water and that's a whooping 15000 terawatt hour per year energy requirement and a whole new technology whether solar or high temperature nuclear reactor needs to be developed for that and uh, i think luckily we have 50 years but if you do not do this on a war footing 50 years will pass away just like that but uh, it is doable in the time available then we must also augment uh, electricity generation because as i said electricity along with hydrogen and bioenergy are the key supply uh, at the user end now we must augment electricity generation based on an optimum mix of renewables hydro and nuclear and that uh, would account for roughly 10000 terawatt hour per year or more to bridge the shortfall in hydrogen production through high temperature electrolysis so you need nuclear energy for hydrogen production directly in the form of high temperature nuclear reactors and you need uh, the current generation uh, phwrs to be quickly ramped up in capacity to produce larger quantities of electricity that we would need and as i said uh, even doing all that i think certain amount of fossil energy use uh, could be would be in fact unavoidable and so we should quickly develop carbon capture and and utilization technologies now in addition to what i said you would also require some additional critical technologies to be developed those technologies are uh, for example uh, for electrolysis uh, of hydrogen currently everybody is talking about the available electrolyzers uh, call it pem cells or there are also they talk about high temperature uh, proton exchange membrane cells these are not good enough in the long run because you know the energy that is required for splitting water molecule uh, significantly gets reduced if you do uh, electrolysis at high temperature and when i'm talking about high temperature i'm talking about uh, temperatures of the order of uh, 500 to 800 degrees celsius and that requires ceramic technology uh, uh, 
you know, we have solid oxide fuel cell technology, which is ceramic technology. Uh, and it's available on, uh, on small scale, kilowatt scale. In fact, it's available in Indian market. But here we are talking about a much larger capacity. And that operated in reverse actually allows you to carry out steam electrolysis with more efficiency. But even more efficiency, as I said earlier, would be realized by thermochemical splitting of water. And that is where we, of course, I talked about the sources, uh, solar thermal and high temperature reactor. But you need to also develop iodine, sulfur, and copper chlorine technologies. And uh, of course, some good work is done. Uh, Bark is working on iodine sulfur. Uh, Institute of Chemical Technology has very successfully set up a loop uh, in a circulating closed loop. They are producing hydrogen in a small quantity, though, but it's a continuous production in uh, uh, using copper chlorine copper chlorine process. So, uh, uh, but I think we are miles away from you know taking this technology to the scale that we require. Energy storage is another important technology and production of hydrocarbon substitutes uh, using uh, hydrogen as well as biomass is another area because you know you require feedstocks uh, of, uh, of different kinds. And uh, so, uh, of course, I think petrochemical we can, uh, can perhaps still do using, using crude uh, or other uh, kind of hydrocarbon sources in a manner that it doesn't uh, add to the, uh, the carbon footprint and trap the carbon in plastic. So, but that itself is another set of development. And of course, uh, carbon capture utilization and sequestration, which I mentioned. So these are critical technologies, development of which is a must. Now, uh, a word about the cost of uh, the clean energy transition or uh, cost of, I would say, specifically decarbonization of uh, the electricity grids. Uh, you know, we go by saying that oh, there will be plenty of solar energy, wind energy, we'll get plenty of uh, low cost loan from outside. Uh, but we should be aware what it is going to cost to us. And uh, just to bring that uh, point home, uh, let's compare what, uh, what were the estimates for US, what's the estimates for Germany, which has done very well in this context, and what it could be for us. In the United States, for example, the, the, the annual uh, electricity production currently is around 4,000 billion units. Decarbonization of US power grid rapidly has been estimated to cost around $4.5 trillion by Wood Mackenzie. In Germany, their grid is uh, around uh, 650 billion units, much smaller than us. And that country, is, you know, they are already implementing this problem uh, uh, this challenge and uh, they're, they're spending uh, US dollar 580 billion to overall its energy system. Now, look at in the context of these cost numbers, look at India. India's current electricity production is around 1,600 billion units. And as I said, now uh, we may go uh, much more. And of course, uh, this slide is a little dated. As I told you, we may have to go to something like uh, uh, 15,000, 16,000 uh, terawatt hours, uh, that kind of a grid size. So it could be easily four times or five times that of uh, United States. Uh, so you can imagine the cost of decarbonization of Indian grid at that time and compare that money with uh, India's GDP today or even at that time, and you will find that these numbers are simply unaffordable. So we need to make sure that our strategy is cost optimum 
both in terms of what it will cost the consumer, but also in terms of the total capital cost. And that is very important. And I don't see much uh, discussion in the country on that count. Now, let me come to nuclear. I'm uh, uh, towards the end of my talk. I'll finish in another five minutes. Uh, so I think uh, it's very clear to me, and I'm sure it must have been clear to all of you, that uh, our nuclear program has to be rapidly ramped up. Pratyus, you will also be interested in energy transition first. Hmm? Sorry? No, no. Yeah. So uh, that, uh, sorry. Uh, now, we are setting up, you know, we have this 700 megawatt PHWR, which is the workhorse for the current program. This technology has achieved global standards in the sense several of our PHWRs have received global recognition. And more importantly, 100% value addition is in the country. And we do it at half the capital cost in terms of per megawatt cost. Uh, compared to any other system anywhere else. And, uh, and so uh, we are already Atmanirbhar, right from, uh, you know, thanks to Dr. Bhava, uh, for a few decades we are Atmanirbhar. But the question is, in scaling up and reaching the scale that we require, uh, can we do it in an Atmanirbhar manner? Or in the process, uh, we will become Paranirbhar is something that I think we need to seriously think. And as a matter of strategy, I have been recommending that we should take up three additional fleets of 10 megawatts as have been approved now. There is aggressive construction going on, but three additional fleets we should take up and take them up for construction in fleet mode. Uh, maybe by NPCIL, maybe by NTPC joint venture, or maybe uh, in, in some other uh, formation. Uh, I think it's also important that India should become an ex exporter of this technology. All countries who have, who have their own technology, in fact, even after making a few reactors, they start exporting. And this is very important for our own efficiency, competitiveness, and most importantly, balancing the industrial production. Somehow we have not paid sufficient attention to that aspect, but we need to catch up, even though it will mean extra work, but it actually contributes to economy and it's very important. Uh, we must also pursue setting up light water reactors, which we have negotiated uh, with uh, the Americans, with the French, with Russians, of course, the program is going on, but more could be more could be set up, and we should develop an indigenous uh, small modular reactor uh, in a consortium along with industry, DAE, NTPC, and uh, set up uh, these projects in PPP mode at sites which will be anyway retired uh, uh, or it will be vacated by retiring coal plants. And uh, so that will be an additional stream, but that cannot really add to voluminous uh, scale up, which the larger size reactors can, can add. And while we do that, because the scale up has become very important, we have this, uh, we cannot miss 2070 by, by any imagination, but we'll have to look for energy sources uh, even beyond and uh, in the long run. And as I told you, if you have, I have told you the total energy uh, kind of picture in the country. So going forward, nuclear is the only way. And so we must uh, accelerate three-stage nuclear program, uh, fast reactors, thorium reactors. So we already have HWR design. Uh, we should also think in terms of the, uh, the uh, molten salt reactor, which would be the more optimum system in the third stage and develop high temperature reactor for for hydrogen production. So all these technologies, I think uh, we must uh, pursue. And eventually, of course, we need to reach fusion energy, which also India is a partner in, in fusion energy. So I think uh, the, the net zero emission target 
has to my mind put a very heavy responsibility on leveraging nuclear energy and the only other alternative is if you don't like nuclear then we have to remain underdeveloped for all time to come i don't see a third possibility so that is the important of uh, accelerating our activities i want to end by just making some quick comparisons with china you know china and india we were roughly on par when uh, the two countries became independent today uh, you look at uh, for example in the context of uh, energy on every parameter china has gone way ahead raced ahead and uh, and this is very important because after all they are our neighbor they are contributing to global competition in economic progress in trade and so on and so this is uh, this is very very important uh, and uh, unfortunately we have lagged behind uh, which i'm sure is going to cost us but we should catch up to the maximum extent possible the same comparison uh, can be seen Uh, in terms of actual data as uh, the in terms of energy mix as well as in terms of the trends that have gone on so far so uh, uh, it tells that how much we have missed the bus and how much we have catching up to do our vulnerability with respect to oil is much higher both in terms of share in energy use as well as import dependence and similarly china is moving much faster in terms of energy share from low carbon energy use so uh, friends i close here uh, thank you again for uh, patient hearing and uh, and i hope i am able to convey uh, how in my view uh, and this is of course a very broad view detailed analysis has to be done but Uh, uh, a macro view rarely goes wrong back of envelope calculation the order of magnitudes are right actual numbers may need to be fine tuned but i think we need to do a lot of work first of all defining our policies defining our program uh, defining our strategies and more importantly implementing that strategies without delay i thank you thank you thank you dr takotkar for an excellent uh, and comprehensive analysis of clean energy options for india I, i'm sure you will be happy to answer questions yeah surely are there any questions to dr takotkar please sir may i come in yes please yeah uh, thank you dr takotkar for a brilliant talk and articulating so well i think uh, one important point which you made that uh, we need to have a composite view of the energy as a whole now currently as you know that we don't have that kind of a mechanism or a framework or a structure do you envisage uh, that how we can uh, create such a mechanism where the energy as a whole can be looked at and that can uh, provide the net zero by 2070 well i think that is very important and uh, uh, in fact uh, at one stage you know in france a uh, long time back this was i'm talking about 2008 9 that uh, time period uh, this the cea which is the uh, organization equivalent of dae uh so uh, they transformed their mandate and name to include alternate energy in their portfolio uh, and uh, and so because you know this new transition they as, as you can see and they realize that in fact they told me even at that time uh, it's a huge amount of technology development so it's not a question of uh, just combining departments yeah but it's a combine it's a question of combining efforts on a in a manner where there is capability to create new technology the mission motor the way it had happened in dae 
So I had actually made a proposal of that kind. Of course, I didn't have enough time to follow it through. But uh, your point is absolutely right. I think you need to uh, you need to uh, first of all bring in a holistic thinking, and uh, uh, and uh, also a, a a kind of a an effort which is integrated uh, together. So uh, of course it can be done in in several different ways. I'm not saying that there is only one way, but I'm only pointing out that there is a huge technology development component along with it. Uh, for example, uh, I uh, was asked to sort of be the first chairman of the SECI Solar Energy Corporation, and uh, in spite of my great efforts to bring in new technologies and in fact, particularly solar thermal, I was championing, but it simply got rejected because they issued the tenders and found that solar thermal is expensive. And it is expensive because you know you get quotations from abroad, and you know custom built, uh, uh, custom designed equipment done abroad is obviously going to be much expensive. But the technology is actually nothing which cannot be done in the country, and you can do it at half the cost as we are doing nuclear. But uh, there was no mood for anybody to listen to that. And so you know what is happening to solar energy in the country, which is good. I think uh, scale up uh, for photovoltaic, I think, is a great story. We should be all very happy and very proud about it. But uh, looking in the hydrogen context, you see what we have missed. And we'll need to catch up. But your point is right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions, please? I'm sure there are many questions. He has covered an entire spectrum of energy options for India. There are questions in the QA box. Oh, are there in the box? Yeah. If you uh -huh. want, I can read it out. No, no, I'm slowly. Uh, no, I'm getting uh, but, it. Uh, but if you want to make a selection or something, I think uh, chairman's prerogative. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they are there in the QA box. No, now, now we are getting it. Now there is a question by Anil Razdan. I'm sure he is our old colleague, uh, Dr. Kakotkar. What is the year for peaking of emissions that you visualize while reaching net zero by 2070? And what is the 10-year period investment window that you may have calculated for nuclear capacity till 2070? Yeah, these are both very important questions. Uh, talking about uh, peaking, uh, see, there are two aspects to this peaking year. One, to make uh, commitments to the international community. And there I'm of the firm opinion that uh, we should not make any commitments. Because, uh, you know, you need peaking air to define the, the profile of your uh, you know, carbon emission trajectory. Uh, but uh, uh, okay. if you make international commitments, then there will be pressure saying that uh, okay. instead of this, you do that and, uh, and things of that kind, which may distort our picture. But I think as far as domestic uh, uh, program is concerned, it is probably important that we have. Uh, sorry, Dr. Chidamana? Yes. Yeah. So uh, it is important that uh, uh, we have for planning purpose a peaking year. And uh, sooner we have that peaking year, better it is because otherwise uh, uh, the trajectory going downwards will become very steep towards 2070. And these are all related to investments. So it's a question of, you know, we have to spread the investments equally uh, uh, along these five decades. Uh, so we need a program. I haven't made that uh, calculation myself, uh, but, uh, but certainly this should be done. But uh, I thought this dialogue was very, uh, very strong uh, before Glasgow. Uh, and uh, Glasgow is over. Uh, so, uh, but I said, I think without getting into international uh, kind of track, 
we should have that for planning purpose so that we uh, we smoothen our investment uh, profile now coming to nuclear again uh, scaling up nuclear uh, of course you require a lot of investments and uh, uh, the per megawatt okay. per peak megawatt whatever investment one requires for solar which to and what and uh, peak megawatt calculated for given electricity production that is uh, so you know within a 100 megawatt solar plant uh, would uh, produce maybe only 20 25% of electricity as compared to 100 megawatt uh, nuclear plant now if you kind of make it a common thing that is uh, for so many billion units of electricity, what is the capital investment I have to make? Then you will find that the investment for nuclear is, at least in the Indian conditions, is comparable or lower compared to solar. Now, uh, so this is one. But however, we need to find an implementation strategy because getting all that uh, through budgetary resources of the government uh, may not be very easy, but at the same time, it is true that government must come forward with higher budgetary resources. There is a problem there right now. So that should happen. Government should spend what it can, but I think we need to work out and that is where uh, the joint ventures with our uh, uh, financial, uh, financially sound uh, public sector units like NTPC, ONGC, uh, Nalco, this is very important. We had an MOU with them and a joint venture. Unfortunately, that has remained dormant, but I think it is getting reactivated as I understand. And uh, so, uh, but uh, that investment is an issue and going forward, we need to do. And that's where I talked about uh, that small modular reactor where we should build it, uh, design it as an India product in a consortium mode involving local industry and DAE, and then set up those units in PPP mode. And I'm sure it can be done within the existing Atomic Energy Act. So I hope I have answered that question. Okay, Dr. Kakotka, there is a question. Infrastructure cost and time required for use of hydrogen by Ashok Balyan. Would you like to react to that? Yes, uh, well, uh, uh, use of hydrogen, I think you require infrastructure cost at, across the whole chain. Uh, you will require it uh, uh, for the production purposes, you require it at the utilization end, and also you require it in between. Even transportation of hydrogen is not so. And, and I would say many of them are technologically not resolved issues as yet. People talk about high pressure uh, sort of containing uh, in pressure vessels or transmission in pipelines. Uh, but uh, I think one need to prove this technically because there are issues with hydrogen and, uh, and it's not so simple uh, as, uh, as it might appear. Uh, hydrogen storage uh, in different media is also a matter of development. Generation of hydrogen uh, I talked about uh, is also under development. And I'm sure, for example, you want to use uh, hydrogen for greening steel, steel production. One of the uh, important thing is instead of coke, can we use hydrogen? And there is work going on. For example, Tata Steel is, uh, I understand, uh, moving uh, in that direction. But there are infrastructure costs and uh, uh, I have no, no estimate of that. Class, but class I'm only class. looking at it from the perspective of technology, and I think we'll have to do it. Once committed to 2070 target, mm. we have no other alternative. Please mute your other people. You want to ask? Okay. Uh, would you like to comment also on green hydrogen? Uh, Dr. Kakotka, that is uh, production of hydrogen, you should not use uh, fossil, you must use uh, renewable or some other green. Does it uh, have an impact on cost or not really? No, no, there is an impact on cost, and but 
the entire discussion that I was having was in the context of green hydrogen, because uh, it was in the context of uh, fulfilling the uh, net zero emission mandate. Now, uh, I, I also subscribe to the fact that uh, we cannot be waiting for kind of availability of commercially viable green hydrogen and then talk about hydrogen uh, uh, infrastructure. I think we can start with, uh, for example, uh, blue hydrogen. And in fact, I wouldn't go to the extent of even gray hydrogen. Mm. And because uh, there is a lot of effort required in setting up infrastructure at the downstream end, and we can get going with that activity uh, and uh, sort of uh, bring in green hydrogen as and when it is available in a, in a viable, uh, viable manner. So uh, I find there is a lot of debate about green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, uh, gray hydrogen. I find that discussion on color worthless to tell you very frankly, because I think uh, we have to work for green hydrogen. There is no alternative. That's the only option, I agree. Uh, yeah, and okay. then, uh, but you need to catch up on time. So you start using gray and, uh, sure. and blue hydrogen. There is a question on, uh, of course, uh, how to minimize energy wastage. Of course, this is somebody, this is not that. Would you like to react, say something? On yes, yes, minimize? surely. I think energy uh, efficiency is, uh, is important. Mm. And uh, I must compliment our Bureau of Energy Efficiency. They have, uh, they have made a significant contribution uh, in, this, uh, in this regard, and that effort should continue. And as I said in my, you know, in the, in the energy transition, whether for transportation uh, or for through hydrogen, other areas, the, uh, there is bound to be a lot of efficiency. But uh, as I said, provided we, we truly resort to steam electrolysis in, instead of uh, low temperature electrolysis, we truly resort to the thermochemical splitting of water. And actually, uh, I have seen some calculations for the cost of green hydrogen producing, uh, produced uh, through the thermochemical splitting using copper chlorine process. And that is actually quite competitive compared to the numbers uh, that people are talking about. But uh, this is at a very small scale, so I don't want to even talk those numbers. But the fact is that unless we uh, develop those technologies that energy efficiency will not come. Good. So I think uh, we will now come to the uh, conclusion of the question and answer session. And um, we had heard an excellent uh, analysis of uh, clean energy options and transition to that, particularly in the context of uh, the climate change threat the International Panel on Climate Change talks about nuclear, renewables, carbon capture and storage. But uh, Dr. Kakotkar has also talked quite a bit about the importance of biomass, particularly for, for India. And of course, nuclear energy, as he said at one stage, nuclear energy is the only way. And uh, fortunately, the NSG guidelines have now been changed and we have an option to also to import uh, uranium from outside. He showed the plot of the human development index against per capita energy consumption. I agree. I have been showing this curve also, but in terms of electricity consumption, but uh, Anil prefers in terms of energy, energy consumption. The point he made about, uh, I think in the time is right to also think of exporting exporting our uh, technologies. But there is also the question of stability of grid, particularly a lot of renewable energy goes into it, this intermittent small grids. Briefly refer to the fusion option. So that is also, of course, ITER is coming, is, is going on in France. Our Institute of Plasma Research is, is a member of the International Thermonuclear Energy uh, Reactor uh, Project. Because as some of you may know, when it starts from the sun, the solar energy is actually fusion energy at the, in, the, in the beginning. 
so let me conclude we made excellent talk and i like the way he finished particularly if you want to reach the zero carbon target by 2070 nuclear the only way or you remain under developed i think i agree with that and thank you very much dr kakot thank you thank you thanks everybody thank you dr kakot sir thank you very much thank, thank you. you thank you professor naik Varaji, shall we close? Maybe I'll close the session. Okay. Good. All right. Sometimes someone is talking, you know, the other thing is that they look.